Hi, I'm Steve Leto, Special Correspondent for Civic Center TV. I'm an automotive writer. This is very exciting because today we've gotten access to a car collection that very few people get to see, and one of the highlights of this collection is a car so rare, almost no one will ever see this car in their real life. And the gentleman who got us in here to see the car today is Mark Lieberman. Mark, it's good to see you again. How are you? Thank you. Very good. Okay. Tell us about the car that we're looking at today. This is a 1936 Stout Scarab, built by William B. Stout. Okay. And this automobile is only one of six to maybe even as many as nine produced total. Okay, now, who is William Stout? William Stout was an aeronautical pioneer. He developed all kinds of interesting things early in aviation history. For example, the internally supported cantilever wing is his design and his construction. Okay, now, does Stout's aeronautical background play out in any way in this car? It actually does. He wanted to use aviation design in order to make a more efficient automobile. Okay. And so when you look at the Stout Scarab, what kinds of things will you see on it that are reminiscent of, say, an airplane? Well, first, the outer uh, appearance of the vehicle. He wanted to make this car very smooth and aerodynamic. By doing so, and that's why he called it the Scarab, he used the concept of an exoskeleton. This car has uh, steel ribs inside a, an aluminum coating, uh, aluminum covering with magnesium doors. Okay, and aluminum and magnesium are also materials that we think of from aeronautics, correct? Indeed. Okay, now the Scarab, you said they only built a few of them? Between six and nine. Documentation is pretty sketchy from when he was building these automobiles in Dearborn, Michigan. Okay, so since we've never heard of Stout, um, he didn't build that many cars. Tell me some more about the car company. How did his car company operate? Well, he started out as an engineering laboratory. And interestingly enough, he wanted to build uh, efficient automobiles that were unlike the cars of the time. And by doing so, he felt that he would capture a whole new market. Okay, how did he raise money for his operation? Well, he was um, an out-of-the-box thinker. Okay. Uh, he would approach industrialists and he used the motto, invest your money with me and you'll lose your shirt. And in doing so, he was trying to depict the fact that this is not going to be an overnight windfall, that he was developing something for the long term. So as far as investors goes, like truth in advertising, he's letting them know that you're probably going to lose a lot of money. And since the company didn't make more than a dozen cars, obviously, he was right in many respects there also. True. And interestingly enough, his approach worked. In this instance, he was able to gain money from Henry Ford, from Philip Wrigley, um, Will Dow. All the big industrialists of the time decided to buy these automobiles at $5,000 a pop and put money in capitalizing his lab. And also, didn't he have a special relationship with Henry Ford on some level? He did. Um, he used Henry Ford's engine, flathead V8, and his three-speed manual transmission to power this automobile. Okay, and then what about, I mean, when we look at the car, we can see that it's very streamlined looking from the outside, underneath the car, inside the car, things that you can't see by looking at it parked. What's different about this car? Well, the first thing he did is he wanted to maximize interior space. In doing so, he eliminated the fenders and the running boards of what were typical in automobiles at that time. So by doing so, he brought a huge additional dynamic to the inside of this automobile. You not only have all this additional space front to rear, but you also have it side to side. And in doing so, he was able to create a rear seat that traverses the entire width of the automobile, a fixed front seat, but then more interestingly, he put two independent chairs inside that are actually on skids. You can place them anywhere within the automobile to set up whatever sort of configuration you wanted. So it's kind of like the family minivan, but just decades earlier. It's also rear engine, rear wheel drive, and that also eliminates the, 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 the hump you have in the middle of the car, correct? Correct, there is no drive shaft. He designed his own transfer case, again using um, uh, Henry Ford's flathead V8, and the three-speed transmission, that coupled to his chain-driven transfer case to drive two half axles for four-wheel independent suspension on this vehicle. So again, the suspension on the vehicle was way ahead of its time also, correct? Another very unusual point with this. 
he used oleo shocks, which were of aviation design, with coilover springs on the front. This gave a very unusual, at least predicted, uh, uh, result. And what he was going for was being able to get the vehicle to bank into turns. Actually, instead of, of uh, a car of the time which would have body roll and would throw you to the out of the vehicle, in this instance, it actually is designed to tilt inward into a turn. And since the car is so high, or so tall, it would seem that would be a very beneficial thing, because otherwise the car would seem very top-heavy, correct? Indeed. Um, he picked up additional floor space by this type of configuration, and by using a tube, uh, uh, a steel tube chassis, supporting the, the lower components of the vehicle. As I was walking around the car, I noticed, for instance, it doesn't have door handles. How do you get into the car? Well, it has electric push buttons with solenoids, the first of its kind, in order to gain entry to the vehicle. Another uh, aviation styling tip was he went ahead and eliminated door handles and external hinges. How many stout scarabs were built? Somewhere between six and nine. And do we know where they all are today? Uh, well, there are five surviving vehicles. Okay. And we know the location of all of them although even one of them is in a very difficult location to get. And where might that be? At the bottom of Green Lake. Okay, so that's a lake in Michigan. How would a stout scarab end up at the bottom of a lake? Well, Bill Stout, in his ingenuity and a very efficient approach to many things, decided that he was going to repurpose the drivetrain to one of these vehicles. Took the engine transmission suspension out of it and then slid this out on the lake and used it as a fishing shanty. Mark, they only built a handful of these cars. What went into making this car look like it does today? Well, in this instance, the owner assembled a team of experts to look at finishes, materials, components, drivetrain, and they took the time to restore each component to its original configuration, and they did a magnificent job. Mark Lieberman, thank you very much. If people want to know more information about Nostalgic Motoring, what would they do? I'm at NostalgicMotoringLTD.com. Okay, and if you want more information about the things I've written, latoslaw.com. I'm Steve Lato on special assignment for Civic Center Television.